Friends, I welcome you to my channel. Before listening to this story, I will ask you to like and subscribe. It is not difficult for you, but it is pleasant for me. And we're starting. I was sitting in her office, staring at the report. There is no doubt Julianne has been cheating on me and has been doing it for quite some time. My suspicions arose that evening. She was drunk. Julianne doesn't drink often, but we went to the neighbor's house for a party they were throwing. Their son returned from the Navy and proposed to his girlfriend. There was a lot of fun, and we both drank more than we should have. None of us were completely drunk, but we were having a lot of fun. And when we got home, I was a little excited, to say the least. I went to the bathroom to brush my teeth and do my night chores. And by the time I was ready for bed, Julianne had fallen asleep, still fully dressed, and only half lying on the bed. I returned to the bedroom and seeing her so vulnerable, ran my hand over her leg in the hope of waking her up. She was only half awake. Please, Ben, she murmured. No more. My name is Steve. Ben is the guy she works with, and who had dinner at my house, whose wife I know, with whom we vacationed together. Suddenly I was completely sober. I've been thinking all night. Isn't this just a Freudian blunder? Maybe she's fantasizing about her colleague, or they're actually doing more than just working together. I thought about asking her about it the next day, but I knew she would either laugh at me or explode at me with anger. Julianne, when she's furious, is a scary sight but I need to know. I'd love to say that I'm the kind of man who can put his hand to surveillance equipment or order something on Amazon and tap her phone and purse, but that's not about me. And according to most of the materials that I've read on the internet about such things that you can buy on Amazon, they don't actually work. I'm also not one of those who has enough money to spend on private detectives. Oh, I'm fine. The house is pretty nice, and I'm aware of all my payments, but I don't have thousands of dollars available. I work as an accountant for a small medical IT company. I am engaged in payroll and expenses. It's not the most exciting job in the world, but it pays the bills, or at least my half of the bills. Juliana also works at a local advertising agency. She creates texts for advertising campaigns both on the internet and on the radio. However, she has not yet managed to break through something of her own on television. She earns a little more than I do and we saved money together until we reached the point where she could take a break long enough for the birth of our first child. We have been saving money throughout our four-year marriage. Bedtime love with Juliana is amazing. Even now, after six years of marriage, it has not become a routine. I've heard of couples who make love once or twice a week or less, always on the same day every week and always in the same way. Everything is much more spontaneous with us. It's rare for either of us to reject the other's offer, no matter when or where and she probably makes more offers to me than I do to her. We make love on average four times a week, and there's not a single place in the house where we don't make love. This is both a garage and an attic, and even crawling under the floor once, don't ask. I can't even say that anything has changed in our relationship. We still make love as many times and are as spontaneous as before. That's what I was clinging to in the hope that she just said the wrong name, just because she works with Ben every day and is used to calling him by his first name. It was already four o'clock in the morning, and I still couldn't fall asleep. Thoughts and actions continued to spin in my head. How do I find out and what to do if she has changed? I generated one scenario after another where I find her in the arms of a lover and do anything from blowing out my own brains in the room as they stare in horror at what is happening, to blowing out his brains and then hers. In other scenarios, I just say goodbye to her and leave in dignified silence, get in the car and never see any of them again. But before all this happens, I need to know if she's cheating. I silently got out of bed and went into the living room, where she dropped her purse when we were returning from a party. I looked through it, but I didn't find anything. I don't know what I expected to find. Maybe condoms or love letters? But there is nothing like that. Her phone is locked, but that's not a problem. I watched her unlock it several times, so I entered the number and looked through the calls and SMS. There were calls as well as text messages to Ben. I've read them, but they're all work-related, every single one of them. Of course, I had no idea about the contents of the calls, but still there is no evidence that she did anything wrong. I was just about to put her phone back in my purse when it slipped out of my fingers and fell to the floor. Damn, I thought I might have broken it. I picked it up and examined it carefully for cracks or chips and was relieved to find that there were none. I turned it over and saw that something had slipped between the phone cover and the camera lens. It looked like a credit card. 
I unfastened the phone cover and discovered that it was actually a credit card. Moreover, she went by her maiden name and I didn't know anything about her. Since I am an accountant, I am responsible for the finances of the family. I don't manage the money, but I fill out all the forms, pay all the bills, including credit card bills, and file our tax returns. I didn't understand how or why she still had that credit card. However, it increased my suspicions and fear. I looked into her phone again and searched for the app from the credit card provider. As expected, it was found, and it was hidden in a folder labeled Spam and filled with all the applications that come with the phone and which it is impossible to get rid of. I opened the app and found that a password was required. Fortunately or unfortunately, Juliana had set it up for fingerprint authentication, so I carefully crept back into the bedroom and placed her finger on the screen with the utmost care. She didn't move. The application has opened. Nervous that she might wake up, despite the fact that she seemed so out of her mind, I sent all the statements she had to the printer in my office downstairs in the basement. As soon as the confirmation was made, I closed the app, put the card back in the stash and put her phone back in the case, which I dropped into her purse. After looking into the bedroom once more, I went down to my office and took the extracts from the printer. Everything was there. Transactions were conducted twice a week, on Monday and Thursday, usually around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. $45 from the motel chain. There was the name of the network and the branch number. Ten minutes on the internet told me that the motel is six blocks from the office where she works, so she visits the motel twice a week. Despite the fact that it is quite obvious why she visits the motel, I tried to think of other reasons why she might go there. Maybe they have some kind of conference rooms there and she receives clients there. I laughed at myself. I'm grasping at straws. But even so, I wouldn't have believed it until I saw it with my own eyes. I looked at the reports again and found that these visits started about a month ago. A wave of nausea suddenly hit me, and I barely made it to the bathroom before I threw up. I was on my knees on the floor and spitting into the basin when Julianne came in and bent down to pat me on the back. Have you had too much to drink? What is it? She asked. Me too. Can I get you anything? I shook my head still clutching the papers in my hands and clutching them to my chest, desperately wishing she wouldn't see them. I just need some time, I said. Go back to bed. I'll be there in a minute. All right, she said sleepily. She bent down again and kissed the back of my head. I hit my forehead on the toilet seat when I pulled away from her, but she didn't seem to notice anything. I stayed in the bathroom for another 15 minutes until the nausea passed, and then returned to my office and hid the statements among other papers. I knew that Julianne would never find them by chance. She almost never comes into my office, although I used her more than once, bending over my desk. As far as I know, she never goes in there when I'm not at home. Although, what do I know? As far as I know, she's a faithful and devoted wife. I went back to the living room, but I couldn't bring myself to go to the bedroom. Instead, I sat down on the couch and stared at the wall, thinking. Thoughts kept spinning in my head. Only the most stubborn parts of me were still trying to cling to the fiction that she wasn't having an affair, but I still wasn't fully ready to accept reality. Still wanted more proof. I wanted to be completely sure. I also wanted to know what I would do if it was true. I know Ben. He's a friendly guy. He was in the Air Force, about 15 centimeters taller than me, and I have no doubt he could wipe the floor with me if he wanted to. I will like his wife Mary very much. She was a happy woman. She always seemed to be smiling and their three-year-old Tabata was a pleasure. She's been calling me Uncle Stay ever since I've known her. Of course it's a divorce. That would mean that we would both lose. The house will have to be sold. The proceeds will have to be divided. Each of us has our own retirement accounts, and hers is a little more than mine, since she earns more. Since we do not have children, I could find myself in an enviable position, because I will come out of a divorce better than most men. I doubted that the court would award me alimony, but I was sure that they would not award it to her either. From a financial point of view, the only ones who benefit from divorce are lawyers. I decided to go online and see how easy it is to get divorced by myself. Maybe if Julianne doesn't fight back, we'll come out of this pretty unscathed, at least financially. Is divorce what I want? No, God, no, I love Juliana with everything I have. But I can't stay with someone who didn't love me back. I would literally take a bullet for her. That's how much I love her. I doubt, however, that it is the same in the other direction. She's taking something, but they're not shooting at her with bullets. I felt another wave of nausea, 
but it passed after a couple of deep breaths. I decided to look on the internet about divorces, and then quickly fell asleep. Julianne woke me up with a glass of water and a couple of Tylenol tablets. How are you feeling? She asked, and her face was full of concern. I must look terrible. Looking at my watch, I realized that I had slept for about three hours. My head is splitting, my neck and back are aching from a strange position on the couch, and I just found out that my wife is cheating on me? I feel better, I said. She smiled sympathetically. Both you and me, she said. I took some painkillers before the shower. Now my head is clearing up. How much did we drink last night? Too much, I said, trying my best not to burst into tears and start yelling at her. Go take a shower, she said. You'll feel much better after that. I doubted it very much. I drank the pills and all the water, got up heavily and limped into the bedroom. I threw my clothes on the floor and got into the shower. I could have put my clothes in the basket, Julianne complained, going into the bathroom and picking up the clothes I had discarded. You could keep your legs closed, I muttered back. Sorry, she said. I said I'm sorry, I said, loud enough for her to hear through the shower. I was going to pack it when I got out. It's all right, she said. I did it. Don't forget that we're going to Ben and Mary's for dinner later. I forgot. In fact, I was looking forward to it. Mary is an amazing cook and serves Michelin-starred dishes. We got into the habit of going to them every two months, and they come to us the next month. Julianne cooks well and does a great job in the kitchen, but I always preferred to go to them. Only today I really didn't want to go. I'm not feeling very well, I said. I think maybe he got sick with something. Nonsense, she said. You'll feel fine when the pills take effect. Besides, Tabata will be heartbroken if she doesn't see her uncle stay. We spent most of the day as we usually do on Saturday. Once or twice I saw a look in Juliana's eyes that said she was horny and trying to provoke me into bed. Each time I pretended not to notice and moved on to something else. I don't know if she noticed it or not, but I've been playing the I don't feel well card all day. It seemed to suit her. I wasn't sure that even if I tried to make love to her, I could. I have a terrible feeling that I'm either going to throw up on her, or I just can't handle it. In my imagination, I see Ben lying between her legs and doing thrusts. My imagination doesn't help me at all. I spent most of the evening at Ben and Mary's in a depressed state. Tabitha came and climbed on my lap, which was her habit when I was visiting them, and I hugged her. As soon as it became reasonable, I made her get off again saying that I was sick and did not want her to get sick too. It's alcohol, Julianne said. You're not sick. I still feel sick, I said. And besides, I'm not drunk. Ben looked at me with concern on his face. Oh, buddy, he said. Do you need Tylenol or something? I had an almost uncontrollable urge to punch him in the face, and then the image of him with Julianne came back to me. This time she was kneeling in front of him. I barely made it to their bathroom before I emptied my stomach again. Oh, baby, Julianne said, patting me on the back again. Maybe you're sick. Don't you want me to call a doctor? I shook my head. All they'll say is that it's a virus, I said. They'll tell me to drink water and call them in three days if I don't feel better. Come on, she said solicitously. Let's take you home. I heard her thanking Ben and Mary for the food. When she told Ben, I'll see you on Monday, I retched again. Fortunately, I have already emptied my stomach. I spent Sunday in bed. It was a good reason to stay away from Julianne. I went to the guest room, ostensibly so that if it was a virus, I wouldn't infect her, and also so as not to keep her awake all night. In any case, I slept for a significant part of the day, but my dreams were painful and ragged. I've lost count of how many times I've woken up in a cold sweat. I think I must have witnessed how Ben and Julianne went through the whole Karma Sutra. In my dreams, they made love in every conceivable position. How are you feeling? Julianne asked. It was Monday morning and I was already up and dressed for work. We usually got up at the same time and left at almost the same time. Our offices are about the same distance from our house, but in different directions. I'm a little tired, I said, but I think I got over it. Why don't you take the day off? She said. Make sure. I can't, I said. We have a big audit coming up. I have to be there. She nodded and then leaned over to kiss me on the cheek. I tried my best not to pull away, and I succeeded. All right, she said. Let me know if you need anything. I'll see you tonight. I nodded, and we both got into our cars and drove off in different directions. I drove one block, turned the corner, and stopped. 
I called my boss and said I was sick and might not show up for a few days. All right, he said. If you're not here after Wednesday, call me again. I said I'd call and hung up. And he drove up to his office and then turned off the location service on his phone. I didn't think Julianne would check on me, but if she did, she'd see that the last place the GPS found me was at work. Then I drove to the place where she works and parked. I left the car in plain sight, went and sat down in a cafe on the next street. I brought my laptop and sat by the window as if doing work. I ordered coffee and a Danish pie. I suddenly felt hungry. It was after 12 o'clock when I saw Juliana's car pulling out of her company's parking lot. I'm sure she can't see me through the coffee shop window. I didn't run out into the street, having a good idea where she was going. Besides, Ben's car is still parked in the parking lot. I didn't want to run into him. Then a thought occurred to me. I assumed he was the one she was meeting at the motel, mostly based on the fact that she mentioned his name. What if it's not him? What if it was just an innocent mistake and I accidentally stumbled upon her affair with someone else? I was about to leave the cafe when I saw Ben's car. She was driving in the same direction as Julianne. I sighed. Is it from relief? Is it better or worse that she is cheating with him? I left the cafe and drove to the motel. Now I have a problem. I saw Juliana's car in the parking lot, but it's parked outside the motel office. Ben's car is parked in front of one of the rooms. I hoped they were in this room. Otherwise, I'd have to look in windows all over the motel. I may be arrested. I went up to the room and noticed that it was one of the few with closed curtains, which was a good sign, or at least a sign that I've found the right number. Good is probably not the right word to use. The front of the motel is in shadow, which was a stroke of luck. If the sun were shining through the window, my shadow would be visible even through the curtains. I went to the block and just sat on the floor under the window. Since Ben's car was parked in front, I couldn't be seen by anyone who wasn't on the walkway in front of the blocks. I listened and heard someone talking, a man and a woman, but I couldn't identify their voices or hear what they were talking about. I turned on my phone's camera and lifted it over the edge of the windowsill. There was a gap of about half a centimeter between the bottom of the curtains and the cornice. After all, this is a cheap motel. I was able to look into the room where I saw Juliana sitting on the bed and Ben standing in front of her. All doubts were dispelled over the next ten minutes as I watched and recorded the start of their bed session. I've seen enough. I've been collecting evidence. I played back the video that I now have on my phone, and the images were not bad. I wanted to be sure that both sides could be identified, so I set the camera to maximum quality and took a dozen pictures. Enlarged the image of the faces. There could be no doubt about who was there and what they were doing. I crawled away from the window on all fours. I had thoughts of doing something with his car again, or with hers, but there was no point. I just need to get home and put everything in action. It was a quarter past twelve. I was home by two. By three, he filled out and filed the divorce papers, printing out a copy for Juliana. Her signature was required. If she refuses, I'll have to hire someone to serve her and go to court. If she signs, we can get divorced in just sixty days. I have paid off and canceled our shared credit cards. I opened a bank account in my name and transferred exactly half of the balance of our joint account to it. I made a report on our finances where I indicated all our assets, including the house, retirement accounts, and savings, of which he also took half. Everything was accounted for to the last cent. I could have left. I could have taken my things out. But this is my house, too. I wasn't going to leave until I had to. I couldn't afford to stay in a motel or hotel for a long time. I still need to live somewhere until this is over. I moved all my things to the guest room, freeing up the wardrobe and drawers. I uploaded the video file and photos to my laptop and printed out the pictures from both the video and the photos. I also scanned all the credit card receipts. I wrote a letter to Mary outlining what I had found and enclosed all my evidence. The shipment was scheduled for six in the evening. I wanted to give myself a chance to talk to Juliana before Mary found out about it. She would obviously tell Ben, and Ben would, of course, call Julianne. I was ready. Unfortunately, it was only four o'clock in the afternoon and Julianne would not be home for an hour. I was wondering what Ben would do when Mary attacked him. It occurred to me that he might break in and attack me. I went to the garage and searched until I found what I needed. I've had this baseball bat since I was a teenager. It was a gift from my father, along with a long-lost ball and a glove that looked like a family of spiders had just lived in. I took the bat, cleaned it, and took it into the house.
leaning it against the wall behind the sofa. Close enough to the hand, but not immediately visible. I was hoping I wouldn't need it. Julianne really came early this time. She entered the house smiling. Hi, honey, she said. How are you feeling? She looked at my face and at the stack of papers in front of me. None of them were visible to her. Is something wrong? What is it? She asked. You could say that, I said. Have a seat. I have something to show you. She dropped her purse on the floor and sat down on a chair opposite where I was sitting on the couch. I handed her the divorce papers. She looked puzzled at first, but then her eyes widened. What is it? What is it? She asked. It says here right at the top, I said. I don't understand, she said. Divorce, why do you... Isn't it, I said. Where were you today, Julianne? At work, she said. You know that. All day, I asked. Of course, she said. So you didn't go out at all today? Steve, she said, what's the matter? I gave her the credit card statements. So today was different from the last four Mondays and Thursdays when you went to the motel? Where did you get them? What is it? She asked. A mixture of fear and anger appeared in her expression. Does it really matter? I asked. Were you spying? She accused. How could you? Really? I asked with a slight contempt in my voice. Do you go there? How could I? You've been sneaking into a motel twice a week for the last month, and am I wrong? Steve, she said, catching her breath. I know how it looks, but I promise you it's not like that. I had meetings with clients there. This motel. There are no conference rooms, I said. I checked it out. But they rent out their meeting rooms, she said. It's much cheaper than using the conference center. And what happens at these meetings, I asked. At the motel? Is that how you do business? On your back? She jumped to her feet. How dare you? She almost screamed at me. Do you think that I sell myself to clients for the sake of business? No, I replied calmly. I think you're making love to Ben, that's what I think. That stopped her. She sat down again. Steve, she said. No, I would never do that. I love you. I don't know what you think you know, but you got it all wrong. I have meetings with clients, and at these meetings we do nothing but professional business. At the motel? I asked. Yes, which you pay for with a credit card that I don't know anything about? I keep it separate because it's easier that way, she explained. The company pays the bill. Otherwise, we would have to pay tax for that too. It wasn't true, but I wasn't going to explain the tax laws to her at the moment. I shook my head. So today, I said, when your car was parked in the motel parking lot, were you there with customers at a business meeting? My car? She said. I was driving past the motel and I saw your car. Yes, she said. It was a business meeting. And I take it Ben was there too, I said, because his car was also in the parking lot. Look, I know what it's like, but we were just having a business meeting there. I swear there's nothing going on between Ben and me. I love you. I would never cheat on you. I handed her a stack of photos. She turned white. Her hand went to her mouth. Then I turned on a 10-minute video that I recorded on my phone. I set it up to stream to the TV. Even though the camera was shaking slightly, there was no mistaking who was there and what was going on. Where exactly were the clients at that moment? I asked. Tears began to flow from her eyes, and she started shaking her head. No, 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 she said. This can't be happening. He promised that it couldn't be. It's over, Julianne, I said wearily. We're done. Sign the papers, we'll put the house up for sale, and in two months everything will be ready. Then you can go and date whoever you want. I'm going to go hide in a corner and try to regain some dignity. But he promised, she said. He said that everything would be fine with us. I looked at her, puzzled. Who promised? I asked. Ben, she said. He said you'd never know, and if you did, you loved me, so we'd be fine. Why does he think that? I asked. Why do you think that? I thought you loved me as much as I loved you. Why did you do this to me? And even more. Why did you expect anything other than what would happen if and when I found out? Juliana sat down, put her face in her hands, and began to cry. It broke my heart to see her like this, but I had nothing to offer her. I couldn't comfort the woman who took and trampled on my heart. In a way, I enjoyed her pain, the fact that she was experiencing at least some of the heartbreaking pain that I was experiencing. But at the same moment, my heart broke even more when I saw her suffering. I heard my laptop beeping. My email has been sent. Why? I asked. Why did you do that, Julianne? 
What have I done to deserve this? Was I bad in bed? Did I ignore you? What? She shook her head, still sobbing. It was only supposed to happen once, she said. He promised me only once, but why even once? I asked. I screwed up, she said, still sobbing at work. I almost lost a big client. Ben managed to fix everything, but if my bosses found out, they would have fired me. We'll survive, of course, but we won't be able to afford a house if I lose my job. We were saving money to afford to have children, and we would have lost it all. There was even a possibility that the client could sue me. The price of Ben's help, she said, was that I had to sleep with him. It was supposed to be just one time. One day, and that's it. I didn't want to, but I had no choice. If he had shown my bosses what I had done, I would have been fired and we would have lost everything. Why didn't you come to me? I asked. Even if it meant selling the house, we could have done it. I couldn't, she said. There was no time. I didn't have time. I had to make a decision, give him an answer here and now. I was so confused, upset, and, and I saw a possible way out. I convinced myself that it wouldn't hurt once you'd never know, and we'd be back on an even keel. Even if I believed you, I said, you've been seeing him twice a week for a month. Why keep coming back? He was blackmailing me, she said. The first time he shot a video, I didn't know there were cameras in the room. He said that if I didn't keep seeing him, he would show the video to you. What about Mary? I asked. Did she know? She shook her head. So he loses as much as you do if this gets out, I said. Do you expect me to believe that he would risk his own marriage to blackmail you? It's pointless. I'm sorry, Julianne, but I don't believe you. You volunteered to go to that motel room, and from what I saw on the screen, you were having a good time there. Now you're telling me that he was blackmailing you? No, I don't believe that. But it's true, she said. I had no choice. There's always a choice, I said. If you loved me, you would trust me and come to me. Even if I take the first time as a forced instant decision, you could come to me later and tell me. It would have hurt me. I would have been angry. But maybe I would have understood. I would do anything for you, Julianne. Anything. You destroyed me. Destroyed my trust in you. Destroyed my love. No, please, she said, sobbing harder. Give me a chance. Let me prove to you, show you how much I love you. It's too late. There's nothing you can do or say that would make me believe that you love me. That you've ever loved me at all. There was a crash, and our front door almost flew off its hinges. Ben was standing in the doorway looking at me. You little bitch, he growled. You had to get in my way, didn't you? What, Ben? asked Julianne. He sent photos and videos to Mary. She kicked me out. She's divorcing me and it's all that snotty little shit's fault. No, Ben, Julianne said. It's all your fault. You forced me. You blackmailed me. Now your chickens have returned home. If you want to blame someone, look in the mirror. He reached behind his back and pulled out a gun, pointing it at me. You little bastard, he shouted and pulled the trigger. I still don't know what happened next. I heard Juliana scream and saw her jump up. She wasn't walking towards him trying to get a gun. Her goal was to get between Ben and me. I heard a shot and saw blood splatters when the bullet hit her in the chest. She fell like a sack of shit. Ben's eyes widened when he saw her fall, and he knelt down next to her. He barely had time to look up when the baseball bat that I took out from behind the couch hit him on the head. I went to the hospital with Juliana. She was unconscious. The bullet hit her just to the right of the center. She lost a lot of blood. I was sitting in the back seat of the ambulance and holding her hand, soaked in blood. When we arrived at the ambulance, she was taken out and everything happened very quickly. I was taken to the registry office where I had to specify the details of our insurance. By the time the paperwork was done, she had already been taken to the operating room. I sat in the waiting room looking at the floor, at my hands, at the blood stains, and at my wedding ring, stained with Julianne's blood. I would take a bullet for her, the thought flashed through my mind. I remembered thinking that way when I first suspected her of cheating. It was an indication of how much I loved her, that I'm ready to take a bullet instead. And that's exactly what she did for me. The scene repeated itself in my mind. She knew there was no way to get to Ben, to get the gun. Her motive was to put herself between him and me. We all knew he would shoot. She was willing to sacrifice her life to save mine. Tabitha shouted when I entered the house that was Ben's house three months ago. Ben was in jail awaiting trial. Because of my blow to the head, he was hospitalized for a week, but he was released under police supervision. He was facing a long prison term. 
When I entered the kitchen, Mary looked up. She smiled at me, then came over and hugged me. How did it go? What is it? She asked. It's terrible, I replied. After lunch, I testified to the prosecutors who will be handling Ben's case. They were vicious. They reasoned that the defense would be malicious and would try to get me to say something that would benefit their client. I am determined not to do this. Was this the last time? A voice came from behind me. I turned and smiled at Juliana. I think so. I was told that they have everything. They're going to charge him with attempted murder, not just assault with a deadly weapon. I walked over to where she was sitting at the kitchen table. She tilted her head and I kissed her. The path was difficult for Juliana. A month in the intensive care unit and another month in the respiratory department of the hospital. Even now, she can't take full care of herself. That's why I left her with Mary while I went to the lawyers. Mary turned out to be a godsend. She looks after Juliana when I have to run errands or work. I managed to convince my boss to let me work from home most of the time, so I'm always with her. But sometimes I have to leave. And on those days, Mary and Tabitha come to our house, or I bring Juliana here. It took me almost a month while Julianne was unconscious on a ventilator to decide what to do. Mary found a recording on Ben's phone of his first meeting with Juliana. When she showed it to me, I wanted to go and punch Ben's head with a baseball bat again. There were two files in his phone. One lasted about ten minutes and showed Ben and Julianne making love. But the other, much longer one, showed her crying and begging him not to do it. It is as clear from the second file that she is being forced as from the first that she is there voluntarily. It was cleverly edited. So what Julianne said, at least about the first time, was true. And given the edited file, it can be assumed that she was telling the truth about the rest of the cases. But when it came down to it, the proof was that very moment. The moment Julianne threw herself into the bullets for me. The very measure that I myself used to show how much I love her. I couldn't ignore it. I'd like to think that it was that night that I whispered in her ear that I believed her, loved her, and that if she only woke up, we could be together again. I would like to think that this was a turning point. Until that moment, doctors were not sure if she would survive or not. I like to think that I gave her a reason to live, that just as she saved my life, I saved hers.